Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Auto Guide Show brought to you by eBay Motors. I am one of your hosts, Mike. And I'm the other host, Kyle. This week we have a lot to cover. Kyle and I will argue about the best cars under $30,000. We talk to Genesis about their new upcoming SUV coupe. Two models are teased. And on top of that, we drive two convertibles in the winter. But first, a word from our sponsor. eBay Motors is here for the ride. Your elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a driveway entirely its own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. Welcome back. It's time for us to review our reviews and some of the other features we did this week. So up first is a first drive. And Kyle, looks like you're back in Portugal again. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it's the song that uh, people aren't getting tired of hearing yet. I hope. Uh, I was driving, as we talked about last week, I drove two minis and a BMW. And this is the BMW's turn this week with the new X2. So this is the second generation model. And the big change here is that it's now shaped more or less like the other coupe overs in BMW's lineup. So instead of having that weird quasi shooting brake hatchback look from the previous generation, it now has the sloping roof line. And in this matte green, it was actually kind of good looking in my mind. I mean, it doesn't really look like a BMW anymore, especially from the back, but um, yeah, I, I kind of like it. And as the uh, crashing waves show for people who are watching the video, um, it was really easy to take good photos in Portugal. Uh, does this still have the BMW badge on the C pillar? It does not. No, no, that is gone. Looking at your photos, it's one of those, I need to see it in person. It almost looks cartoony with the, the giant wheels and just the shape. Like it looks like how someone would draw like a cool sporty little off-road vehicle. So, I mean, maybe that's what it's going for in that sense. So. Yeah. And um, the big wheels, it's, it's good that you pointed those out because I think that um, that sort of dominates how this car drives. Sorry, SUV. Wait, no, SAV. Either way, uh, it just it rides very, very harshly. And because I actually drove this before I drove the minis, um, I couldn't really say it in my Countryman review, but I can with the X2 now. I would probably take the Countryman. Uh, for listeners who aren't aware, they're actually built on the same platform. So the mini John Cooper Works and the X2 M35i are very similar in terms of powertrain and output and size. But for whatever reason, the X2 just rides a little harsher. And it was just, it was too harsh for my tastes for just about everything. It was like the um, the old X6M, like the first generation one. Oh, I remember those, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're like the first gen minis too. They, If you got in a, a JCW of those, they were very harsh. Yeah. So moving on to something completely different. Um, I spent a week in a Mazda MX-5, which I still refer to as a Miata, even if it's not officially on the name anymore. Uh, the pictures, you wouldn't know any different except for the bare trees, but this was shot in the middle of February. <laughs> I just happened to have the vehicle sort of last minute. Uh, I needed something, and it was a week around the Toronto Auto Show, so I had events pretty much every day that were right downtown in the heart of the city. So I kind of approached this review and the idea of this car is, can it be a good commuter? Uh, a lot of people, you know, talk about commuter cars are usually small hatchbacks or small sedans that are good on gas, um, easy to put in parking spots, uh, you know, just sort of a an appliance to get down. And then they have maybe a nicer car on the weekends. So what if you, you know, had like a, a 911 or an M3 or a CT5 Blackwing? But you didn't want to take those into the heart of the city, especially if you're doing um, parking garage or outdoor parking. I thought maybe this would work. And you know what? It's uh, I got almost 31 miles per gallon during my week with it. And that was a, almost an even third of hard driving, highway driving, and 
stuck in the city. The thing that I love the most about this is how little it is. I was putting it in parking spots. That I wouldn't even dare some other cars. I had to go around delivery trucks and another car that was taking forever to turn. And there was a fence and um, I squeezed through. And then I think there was a pathfinder behind me. I didn't even attempt it. <laughs> so, I mean, the sight lines with the top up aren't great, but, and the road noise at freeway speeds isn't great, but it keeps the heat in really well. Once it warms up, it's not, there's no draft. It doesn't escape. So yeah, I mean, if you live in an area that doesn't get tons of snow, sort of like we do, uh, and the roads get cleared quickly, it could be a, a fun little car to drive downtown because even in stop and go traffic, it was fun. Like every mm -hmm. time I got in, just going through the gears and revving the engine, even if it, you're stuck there, it was it was great. And then once you got an open piece of road, you really had fun. But um, I can't say the same for many other vehicles I've driven down. I mean, they, maybe they were enjoyable because the seat was comfortable and the music was nice. But this, I was just having fun. Yeah. Excellent. And then you drove a completely different kind of convertible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this was a surprise to get into. Uh, I, I had this a little earlier in the year, so I actually had it, I think, right around the end of January. And it's the 2024 Jaguar F-Type R75. The 75 uh, commemorating the end of the run for the F-Type at all this is the this is the last year this is it and this is the p575 so it's 575 horsepower um on winter tires in january and yeah we haven't really had a lot of snow so i dealt with a little bit of slush but otherwise i drove this thing top down pretty much all the time and it was nice because you and i had the f-type two years ago and we had it in a comparison with the lexus lc convertible and I feel like that kind of um, kind of overpowered the F-Type, and we didn't really get to appreciate the F-Type on its own because the LC is such a magical, wonderful car. But getting to spend some time alone in the F-Type, it's just, it's not perfect. We, we all know that, but it's just so fun and full of character that, um, yeah, it's, it's what I imagine Jaguar should always be about. Yeah, yeah. Um... I assume you drove with the exhaust button open most times because you have Always. to in that car. Yeah. That that comparison we had, we had not the R, we had the other V8 convertible. So that might have been part of it too. But I was around when they first launched this car doing uh, a lot of videos. I was doing similar role, similar role you have now. And I remember the V8 was only rear-wheel drive then. And <laughs> it wasn't nearly as powerful, but it was just, it looked so good. It was so loud. It was so fun. Um, the V6 they used to make with the manual, that was a great model too. And you got the center um, exhaust, which was pretty cool. But yeah, when we drove it, I guess it's almost two years ago now, you, it was feeling its age. Um, it's yeah. still cool because it looks nice and it makes sound. But once you're in it, you're like, oh yeah, this car's been around. And I mean, the MX-5 is no different. That thing's almost hitting a decade since they launched it. And yeah, they're doing updates here and there. And next year it's getting even more updates. But when you're sitting in it, there's definitely things that say, yeah, this is the middle of the 2010s. Yeah, and and the Jag, like, to its credit, that's, I feel like that's kind of the point, and people want that. They don't want cutting edge in, in an F-Type, and it's it's serious money now. You're looking at, like, Z06 territory, entry-level 911s or loaded uh, 718s. Like, that, that's a lot, but the cabin is still really nice. The heater is super effective, so it made it easy to drive top-down all the time. And uh, yeah, my only real complaint about it is that the the trunk is terrible. It's a weird, weird shape. It's like someone was really upset with Tetris and just made a shape that somehow could only exist in Tetris in three dimensions. I, it's, it's not good. And the infotainment is ancient. But otherwise, I mean, it's it's nice and it's really good to drive around all year wrong now that it's all-wheel drive. Yeah, when the V8 went all-wheel drive, that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So next, um, we had one of our freelancers, Evan Williams. He went to a Mitsubishi event. It wasn't really showcasing a new car. It was showcasing their super all-wheel control, their SAWC. And they were using Outlander um, PHEVs. Mm -hmm. And he went into great detail about how the system works and what it does. And similar to electric cars, it has um, a mo motor in the back. And then the gas in the front. Well, it's not like your car, but it has the ability to power each wheel independently 
when needed. So it has real torque vectoring, unlike a lot of systems that can send power to the back. And maybe there's a limited slip that will mechanically work. Um, this will actually power up one wheel or the other in the back. And he said it was almost boring driving around on the snow and ice because of how well the car would counter whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. he said, um, they had they had models there even where they disabled that so you could see what it drives like normally. And he said it felt like every all wheel drive um, crossover SUV he's driven. And then when they turn it on, he said, oh, um, I haven't experienced it. It's even more sophisticated probably than uh, an example I'll give. But I remember when the Juke Nismo first came out. Um, never you get a manual on the RS or you get the auto with the all-wheel drive. Mm -hmm. And I remember driving that in a very, like, it was like an ice snowstorm. Roads were so slick. And I was like, I'm going to take this out and, you know, see how this works. And I had a very similar feeling. I would take a corner and just hammer the gas, trying to get the back end to kick around. And the car would just turn and then go straight. And then, like, hills where people were struggling, even, like, some Subarus, I was just straightened up because that had real torque vectoring for the, the rear axle. So, um, yeah, it sounds like it's a great system. Um, even if I wanted to, I couldn't try it this year because it's not snowing here. But <laughs> No, it's true. They, uh, they had us... We, I was on the launch for this a little over a year ago, and we were in Vancouver, and it had just snowed in a very freak accident way. And uh, yeah, a lot of people were having a hard time on the roads. And we drove this, we took it to a little snowy um, private area. And yeah, I, I didn't get in nearly in depth as much as Evan did, but it's, it's an impressive system. Absolutely. Yeah. And then um, rounding out the week, you drove a car that I actually can't wait to drive. Yes. Yes, I drove the 24 Buick Invista Sport Touring. Um, <laughs> I uh, Mine was pretty close to this image. Uh, it was black, so that's unfortunately really hard to photograph. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, we've talked about its sibling before with the Chevrolet Trax. And the Invista is the same sort of idea. It's a front drive only um, coupe like SUV or crossover uh, with a really affordable price tag and tons of features. I came away really impressed with it. It's kind of, it, it's in a weird part of the market where there's no real direct competitors because everything else in the premium segment is much more expensive and probably not front drive and, you know, 140-ish horsepower, but it doesn't feel underpowered. It drives really smoothly and pretty car-like. To me, that's a benefit. It's just riding a little higher. The one complaint I really have about it is that it rides on ridiculously oversized tires for what it is. <laughs> it rides on 245 with 19-inch tires, and that means that the fuel economy isn't great. But beyond that, I mean, it's comfortable, it's really spacious, and I got a lot of compliments on it because I took it to a family wedding, and people were like, oh, what is that? I had no idea, because it has the new uh, Buick logo on it. All right, well, that wraps up this section. Um, we're going to take a break. There's a lot more where I can talk about that car, but we just might talk about it later. Yes. So when we come back, there will be, uh, we'll do a recap of the news of the week. All right, welcome back to the Auto Guide Show brought to you by eBay Motors. We're now going to cover the news of the week. And one of the big stories of the week is Dodge is ready to reveal the Charger EV uh, next week. They're going to drop three teasers. Uh, I think the big news coming out of this is the fact it is for sure going to be called Charger because we weren't even sure about that. We, we <laughs> assumed it would, but... Um, I guess they're showing just the EV for now. I know there's been talk of there will be a Hurricane six-cylinder turbo model down the road. Um, will it be the Charger? Will it be something else? Who knows? It'd be kind of cool if they put the uh, Ram range extender system in this. I don't know if it would fit, but if you could put the V6 and the plug-in hybrid stuff, that'd be pretty cool. That would be. I'm not entirely sure how it would work but i'm curious i mean maybe maybe people could sacrifice a trunk these are big cars you can put everything behind the front seats uh yeah i uh, just a big skateboard underneath <laughs> yeah so yeah we'll, we'll know hopefully more next week um there was images that surfaced quite a few weeks ago of a 
coupe that was supposed to be it, but I find it odd that it would only be a coupe. So maybe it'd be a coupe and a four door. Um, who knows? Maybe the coupe's dropping first as an EV to kind of show off what it can do. I would assume the top trim will have all wheel drive. And I know it's like rumored about 800 horsepower, and it's going to be something that will, it'll be a Dodge. So it'll be an absolute quarter mile monster. So mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about that. Me too. And speaking of teases, there was another one, a big one from Infinity. Yes. So, go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, you you got to see this or something very much like this recently, did you not? Oh, I saw the QX80. Uh, <laughs> I had the wrong name last week, and I figured out what it was, and I forgot again. I think it's... Uh, I can't remember. But it was basically the concept of the EV that's coming. Okay. I think this is the real QX80. I know they're going to do both, so I don't know if they're going to show both, but they're they're calling it the Q, the next QX80, basically. I mean, if you look at these images, um, it's hard to tell what it is, but <laughs> I, I could be where they uh, release the EV first and then the gas later. But um, I guess we'll find out. I know Infinity is really going for all EVs at a, by a certain date, but um, I just can't imagine there's not going to be a, a gas version, but who knows? Yeah, I feel like there's still a market for these big body-on-frame luxury SUVs to tow regularly, right? Uh, and so that, as we know, is still kind of a, <laughs> a disadvantage with EVs. So I imagine there'd be a gas one, but can't imagine they're going to keep the v8 it's probably going to have to be a, a turbo six at this point right which i mean they have the the one they use in well they've gone using the gtr but it's not going to be that but they also have the one that's the three liter in the um the sedan mm -hmm. um the thing is this platform i would assume would also be an Ar armada assuming that sticks around down the road which is basically a patrol which I assume also sticks around because that's a popular vehicle around the world. So uh, I can't imagine they'd go without a gas version other places, but we'll have to wait and see. Well, mm -hmm. Again, we'll find out more um, not next week. This one's quite a few weeks away. They're really doing the long lead here. It's true. It's it's like it's on a date of some sort of auto show or something. That's so strange. Weird. And then uh, the big news that we do actually know things about, um, I'm just going to bring it up before I get all my numbers wrong. Volkswagen has once again updated the ID4. Yes, um, and and Mike is pulling these numbers up because we got this minutes before we started recording. Uh, so it's it's pretty new, but it's yeah, VW doing uh, another round of updates to its EV. So we're all on board for that. Yeah. So the big news is the. Um, well, inside the infotainment system is going to be replaced with the new one that's going in many other models. So uh, Volkswagen has listened to the complaints about the current one, and uh, I believe the GTI is also going to get it. So I can't wait to see that. Um, and then the other big news is on the power front. So the upgraded sort of longer range vehicles have a new 82 kilowatt hour battery pack. And... Um, in partner with that, there's also more power from the electric motors. So the base will still have the 201 horsepower, but the upgrade rear wheel drive will now have 282 horsepower and 402 pound feet of torque, which is a wow. lot in a rear drive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a way to disable the stability control. You need some nice burnouts in that. Um, and then the all wheel drive is going to pump up to, uh, I know it's 335 horsepower, and I can't find where the torque is right now um if i do i'll let you know okay uh since you're scanning the numbers mike since we're we're doing this right here uh is there any word will this additional power negatively impact the range or is range still okay um okay it doesn't seem like they <laughs> label torque so i'm not crazy. Okay. uh no uh better range too so I don't know if you off the top of your head have memorized the ID4's range, but the entry is still 206 miles, but the upgraded rear wheel drive will get 291 miles on a charge and the dual motor pro SL wheel drive will be 263. I think those are, are, are pretty small uh, increases, yeah. like less than 10%, but 
but increases nonetheless. And I mean, so getting more power and more range, I can't complain about that. Yeah, the um, the rear-wheel drive model, I think has like 40% more power or something. Like, but it's a significant up step. Like 282 is a lot. So yeah, uh, yeah, it's good to get more power, more range, and um, a better infotainment system. Yeah. I just kind of feel bad for 23 ID4 owners now. I, I just hope, I'm guessing they probably don't cover it, but I'm really hoping that they keep that blue and white uh, interior that we had in our mega test last summer, because that is an excellent looking interior. Yeah, the interior photos are just black. Uh, of course. How very German. All right. And our final, uh, second last news story, sorry, is Fiat dropped five very interesting concepts this week. Um, they have all follow a similar design. It's very blocky with sort of like 80s dot matrix lighting in the front. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of like the I Ionic 5, but like taken to the next level. The interesting one is they have a little pickup. Um, Fiat sells a lot of pickups around the world. Just because we don't have one in North America, uh, they are very popular in other markets. So this probably will make it to production. And with the 500e just launching in North America and once again being the brand's only product now that the 500X is dead, maybe some of these will make it. Maybe that pickup. I mm -hmm. hope something makes it. Yeah, I mean, to show five of these, yeah, one of them has to hopefully make it to production, even if it's a slightly changed form. I, I kind of dig this, though. I think it looks uh, it looks cool. It's very different from everything else on the road. Yeah, it's probably one of those that are just showing what the platform can do. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, it's one of those probably nice flat electric platforms, and you can just put any body that you dream up on it. And like you said, something will come from it. it might not be this. So probably, I'm sure we'll get a crossover SUV and maybe two of them, but maybe we'll get something else like a little pickup or, or who knows what, mm -hmm. maybe a little like off-roader. Oh, yes. And the final news bit is our uh, patent sleuth has found another one. So digging through the um, European patent applications, he found that Lamborghini has patented uh, Hercon STJ. So, there's an Aventador STJ, which was like a wilder version of the Aventador. Mm -hmm. But the Huracan already has the STO, which is way crazier than anything with just wings and everything everywhere. So we're not really sure what this means. I mean, it's just a patent that they're going to use that name. Um, we're speculating. I doubt they'd put out a less crazy version now. Lamborghini always seems to sort of one-up what they're doing. So uh, our news editor... Chase um, is theorizing this could be the send off for the car because the V10 and that car are not going to be around much longer. So, no. so I don't know. Like maybe it'll be a rear drive. Maybe it'll have a manual. Like some, maybe it'll be something. You know, that's a big send off. But we'll have to wait and see. So I'm not entirely familiar with my current Lamborghini uh, badges because, well, Lamborghini, if you want to send us press cars, by all means, go ahead. Uh, but I feel like. J's normally signify at least modern times. They're usually the drop tops or the convertibles. So STJ could be an STO convertible, which seems kind of counterintuitive to me because it's basically a race car for the road. But um, maybe it's that. I, I I don't know. I'm just guessing here. Yeah, I yeah, you're right. Um, I'm trying to think if there. I think there was an SBJ hardtop. Aventador, but there also wasn't an STO. So, um, yeah, it's <laughs> someone at Lamborghini, their entire job is just taking one badge and another badge and then just smashing them together and see what happens. My theory is it stands for Sayonara Joyful V10, but that's probably not what the letters really stand for. Only because they probably wouldn't want to include a Japanese word in there, but other <laughs> maybe there's a, an Italian word. But yeah. anyway, um, that's it for the news. Uh, we will be taking a, another break to have a word from our sponsor, eBay Motors. And when we come back, we'll be talking to Genesis about the design of their newest SUV. eBay Motors is here for the ride. Do you remember your first car? I sure do. I was fresh out of university and I wanted nothing more than a car. So I went to some dealers with two things in mind. I wanted a two-door coupe and I wanted a manual transmission. After looking around, I finally ended up with a 2003 Oldsmobile Alero 
coupe with a five-speed manual and a four-cylinder engine. A lot of people didn't understand why I bought that car, but I loved it. I would take it everywhere. I also wanted to modify it. I put a lot of parts on that didn't work. I put on some wheels and they ended up ripping apart my rear brakes and I had to get rid of them. My intake, my exhaust, my suspension, and some interior bits were all custom made. It would have helped so much if there was some sort of way that I could get guaranteed parts for my car back then. Another thing I loved to do with the car was I would take it drag racing. I do low 15 seconds and thought I was so fast, which I wasn't. But you know what? I was having a blast and I was getting to run the car harder than I was allowed to on the street. I also went to a lot of charity car shows, road trips, and weeks up at the cottage. I had the car for almost two years until one day it was written off in a snowstorm in Detroit by a mail truck. It was a sad day and I really missed that car. One day, maybe I'll get another Alero, but for now, I'll just have good memories of this car and how much fun I had with it. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. Thank you for sticking around. We are doing our usual interview section, but it's a little different this time. We are at the Toronto International Auto Show and we are inside the new Genesis GV80 Coupe with a special guest. If you don't mind introducing yourself. My pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is John Krasewski and I'm the Senior Chief of Design for Genesis in North America. And um, yeah, ever since uh, Genesis was a nameplate and then separated uh, into its own brand from Hyundai, I've uh, been leading the team for the last several years. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, we're, we're very happy you came to join us. So we'll start with um, sort of the, the underneath of this vehicle. So mm -hmm. included in the GV80 Coupe is the uh, turbocharged with the electric supercharged engine that currently was only in the G90. What mm -hmm. was the thought process of including it in this coupe? Well, we, we definitely, we, we were really passionate about the idea of creating a coupe, but the last thing we would want is just to create something that speaks to sportiness without being able to match it with the performance. So uh, we definitely wanted to make sure that if you were buying into it, you knew that you're getting something more than just a, a sports car look, you're getting the performance to match. Yeah, that's great. I've driven the G90, obviously, mm -hmm. and I really like the seamless sort of transition on that that engine. So I'm looking forward to trying it in this down the road. Um, while we're on the topic of performance, uh, Hyundai has their end division for mm -hmm. performance, and a lot of your luxury competitors like BMW have M and Mercedes have AMG. Mm -hmm. Is there any thoughts uh, that maybe Genesis could have something like that one day? I would love it. And I'll just speak from a design perspective where, you know, our whole design team, we're, we're all huge motorsports enthusiasts. Uh, we, we look to motorsports as inspiration a lot of times when we're, we're developing our designs and ideas. And I'll just say that I think the brand has a very high ceiling. So the, the potential is always there. No, that's great to hear. Because I think um, with your design, mm -hmm. it would really suit a, a high performance version. Not that these are, are any sludge, right. but, you know, it'd be really cool to really go all in. Um, and you were talking a lot about design. I know that's sort of what you really like. So mm -hmm. what on this vehicle is like your single favorite design element? Well, definitely the, the, the rear, the coupe portion of the center line. I think that's what, what speaks the, the most to the idea of this very athletic aspect of our design ethos, which we always look at athletic elegance, but this is really pushing it really to the far end of athleticism and gives it the, the whole dynamism that you would expect in a car like this. And I think from a design standpoint, it's it's that those kinds of things that, that separate it out from, let's just say, an SUV, a traditional SUV. I, I know that when we were talking about doing a coupe, it's it's easy to take things away, uh, take volume away. But when you take take volume volume away, you're also losing something. So we wanted to make sure that it was less deductive and more about putting more pressure and tension into the coupe, so that really it really feels like it's about to lunge forward less of just you know changing the center line yeah um, i'm not just saying this because you're here but a lot of suv coupes 
the styling doesn't translate well. Whereas yeah. this one, I really like what you did with sort of the, how it kicks up a bit at the mm -hmm. end and it just seems to be properly proportioned. Some yeah. kind of get bubbly at the back or it mm -hmm. literally looks like they just chopped off the roof. So. No, thank you for that. Yeah, and, and a lot of it too, you know, goes into plan view to, to make sure the way you, you're able to taper everything as well. And like you had just added the, the, the little kick up in the spoiler. It's, it's those finite details that, that really take it to that next level. So Kyle, who couldn't make the show, mm -hmm. and I are big fans of uh, sim racing and online racing. And Genesis has been with Gran Turismo now for two versions of the game. I mean, they were tied in with mm -hmm. Hyundai last time, but sure. uh, the new concept just came into the game, which is a mm -hmm. lot of fun to drive. I've right. been having a good time with that. Just how important is it to get sort of your designs into the virtual world in front of other eyes that maybe wouldn't be looking at them? Oh, it was really important. Uh, just as I mentioned before, we're we're super uh, enthusiasts of motorsports, and one of the most frustrating things for us was not being able to drive our Genesis cars in the game. So the the relationship and the partnership formed out of us really wanting to, you know, get our G70 in there, getting our Genesis X in there, uh, getting into the GT3, getting into the GT4 uh, racing segments, and and now we just debuted the the Vision GT, which even with the Vision GT, we wanted to really uh, pay homage to a lot of the, you know, the golden era of racing when you when you get into the late 60s and 70s and develop one of the most, you know, modern reinterpretations of a lot of the beauty and performance that you would have seen in those cars. Yeah, I, uh, I have enjoyed driving all the vehicles. Mm -hmm. Even the G70 is a, is a nice car in that game with the comp it has and how you can modify it. So mm -hmm. I look forward to hopefully seeing more down the road uh, in the future with, with the partnership because I know it's always expanding. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. too. Yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, the final question we have um, is there's no denying Genesis vehicles are some of the better looking ones on the road. I mean, they just have a cool style. Well, I'm glad you said that. If I said it, it might be coming off a little too yeah. strong, but I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously some people will disagree. It's, mm -hmm. you know, beauty, beauty's and I are the beholder, but I really think in general, most people like the style. So how does the balance work, say, internally of designer versus engineer trying mm -hmm. to bring a vehicle together we're you know we're really fortunate our engineering is, is always you know a lot of times you'll you'll get into a project and you'll complain about the package and the challenges around it but I, I think with genesis we've been blessed to have amazing packages to work with and that's why the proportions of our cars and we challenge and we go back and forth quite a bit but one of the things that we can't complain about is is the architecture and package of our cars you know the long dashed axle and uh some of the drivetrains that, that are there and the willingness to collaborate to to make sure that we can optimize the design and and, and really make it something special is, is is all part of that synergy of working closely together and i think from a beauty perspective it's it's really one of the things that, that we spend a significant amount of time thinking about because it's it's not in our best interest you know just to throw things out that might be provocative or, or might be very different i think we want things to have a timeless nature to it so we put a lot of emphasis on, you know, really looking at the car from every aspect, every angle, and then challenging it. Is is it beautiful? And then I think if it doesn't get to that that level of criteria, then then we, we keep pushing. All right. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, I thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank the, you. Uh, the inroads Genesis has made in such a short time, I think, speaks to both design and engineering because mm -hmm. it's pretty easy for people to, you know, see through if one of them isn't so solidly there. So wish yeah. you luck in the future. And, more products down the road. I appreciate that. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome back. So that was pretty insightful from John. And as you could probably tell in the interview, I'm quite a fan of the uh, GV80 Coupe. I like the way it looks. I like the way the normal GV80 drives. So I can't imagine this is going to disappoint. And the Genesis styling language in general, um, I think is pretty unique and attracts attention. And something this big, with the, the sloping roof and the sort of the ducktail back, we'll just get a lot of double takes. I think we'll do a, a lot for the brand. Yeah, I agree. And I'm just going to add uh, my short two cents there. I was at the auto show uh, shortly after you did that interview with um, the award winners for the Canadian Car of the Year. And the Genesis models were sitting there, both the electrified GV70 and G80. And so many people walked by just being like, is that a Bentley? What is that? It, they have serious presence. So I'm sure the, the coupe will too. Yeah, and it's good they found us a, a language to stick with and it's so unique because like that's what all the big Germans do. They you, you can always tell their cars from a mile apart, um, or sorry, from a mile away. Even if it's like a new version, like 
maybe you don't like the new BMW grill, but you know it's BMW. Like there's no mistaking what what that is. So, mm -hmm. so we didn't have any viewer questions, and uh, by all means, please give us a question about anything you want to know automotive related. So this week, uh, I decided we'd play a little game. Uh, I tasked Kyle and I to each select five vehicles that with destination charges ring in at less than $30,000 American. Uh, basically our five best choices to see um, what we recommend and what we think's out there. So Kyle, since uh, I thought up this game, you can start. Sure, yeah. I uh, went with the vehicle that we have already talked about a little bit on this call, uh, this call, this episode, and it's the Chevrolet Trax. Um, it's surprisingly good, uh, especially because if if you remember the old Trax, it was not good. Uh, <laughs> so tiny. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was just. It was. There were no real redeeming qualities, and with Chevy getting out of the car game. It was, you know, it's kind of the big question was how are they ever going to have affordable vehicles again? And the tracks answers that really well. I mean, it's it looks good. Uh, you can see this uh, picture here of an active trim. I'm pretty sure in the nice yellow. Um, it's super spacious. It has more second row legroom than most vehicles in the class above. It's front drive, so it drives like a comfy, slightly high raised car. And yeah, yeah like, uh, the... I was gonna say like, let's not pretend this is some SUV. This is a yeah. compact hatchback car that's just jacked up with giant wheels on it, which is fine. Cause that's what people want to buy. But yeah, Chevy is very smart. I mean, Subaru has been doing that forever with the Outback and then the Crosstrek. Like they you just jack the car up and put us some cladding and, you know, give it some off-road pedigree and people will run to it. So yeah, good on Chevy because um there aren't many compact cars or hatchbacks and if this is sort of what they have to morph into it's not best case scenario but at least it's still something yeah and my only thing again like same with the uh invista that i talked about earlier just put narrower tires on this if there was a way to get better gas mileage out of it it would be an excellent package but even as is you can get a loaded one for well under thirty thousand. so um like I, I think starting this list off, I think we're in agreement that this is a, a, a good pick. Oh yeah, I can't argue with this one. <laughs> and since you brought up Invista, that was my first pick. Uh, it was almost the exact same one that you had driven in your review. So I can't get the Evanair uh, under 30, just no. breaks it. But if I get a Sport Touring or ST and put every possible option on it, I'm still only at 29070. Um, that includes those 19 inch wheels. It has all the safety equipment you'd expect, like all the active stuff, moonroof, lift, power lift gate, power seat, heated seats, 11 inch screen. And it just looks really cool. This and the tracks were parked very close to each other at the auto show. So you could really do a comparison. And the tracks is a good looking vehicle, mm -hmm. but this is obviously a bit more. But when you go over to it, it's just got that kind of look. And when you see them on the road, sort of like we're just talking about Genesis, you're kind of like, what is that? And then you're like, oh, that's the Buick. So. Yeah, I I, uh, I can't disagree with your trucks because I basically took the the higher premium version of it, which um, which the thing I like too is they look very different. I mean, yes, people in the know like us know that they're very similar underneath, but um, on the road you wouldn't really be able to tell. Yeah, and I mean, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say like you know that's something that we definitely. In the 90s, GM was very guilty of having numerous vehicles that basically looked the same. And now, yeah, these are two very different cars, and I think they'll appeal to different people. Although, really, you should look at both of them because they're both excellent. And that Turbo 3 is pretty torquey. It is, yeah. All and right. You get an so actual on, transmission, not a, a CVT. Your next pick. Yes. So uh, I went in a different direction for my next pick. It's also slightly under $30,000. And I'm just going to say it, it might be the performance deal of this entire, you know, uh, little game. Um, mine is the Volkswagen Jetta GLI 40th Anniversary Edition. So if you want a GTI, but you uh, instead want a sedan, 
um, the Jetta will do that. And yeah, it's a performance model, so you can get the six-speed manual. You get a turbo two-liter with 228 horsepower, 258 pound-feet of torque. That's all well and good, but the surprising thing, at least to me, is how well-equipped the Jetta is, too. So you get dual-zone climate control, you get heated front seats, uh, blind spot monitoring, wireless phone pairing, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so this this just slides under thirty thousand by you know six hundred ninety dollars, and um, yeah, I, I I'm really excited. I don't know if I'll get to drive it later this year. I think you might actually be driving one instead, Mike. But um, yeah, yeah, I have one this... booked, and I look forward to it. I I can't <laughs> again argue with this. You're right. I mean, if I was to seriously get a car off this list, that is probably the front runner. Um, mm -hmm. There's some others that I would consider, but it's uh, yeah. They're, I like the Jetta, and that's just a more powerful Jetta. Yeah, it's down on power compared to the GTI, but it's fine. Barely. Um, and I should also add that if you aren't in the market for getting a performance model of the Jetta, you could get a really solid regular trim. And that one is an underdog in the class, right? We, we kind of forget about it in the realm of Civics and Mazda 3s. But uh, yeah, the, the Jetta is really grown up feeling. It's got that turbo engine so it's very torquey and you get insane uh mileage on the highway with it all right well we've got to move on before <laughs> this segment gets too too long so uh my second pick again completely different than what we've done so far i went with the hyundai santa cruz the stylish little pickup truck now uh i can't get the turbo under 30 unfortunately so I need to go with one of the entry-level SEs, but I can give it all-wheel drive and um, some fancy paint, and it just comes in under the price gap of $29,775. Uh, it has 18-inch alloy wheels, LED lighting, wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, uh, a multifunction tailgate, the lockable bed. Like A lot of the core features are there. It doesn't have some mm -hmm. of the fancier bits, but you have a little, basically a compact SUV with an open bed in the back. Um, and the 2.5 still makes almost 200 horsepower. I believe it's 191. So it's not like super slow or anything. And it's still one of the stylish, most stylish vehicles out there. Every time I see one on the road, which is few and far between, I always have to sort of double take like, oh, hey, there's a Santa Cruz. So yeah. Yeah. All right. That's a that's a good pick. I I appreciate your pick. And I go in a similar direction by picking the Ford Maverick XL hybrid. Um, so that's the other small truck on the market. It's more truck-like than the Santa Cruz, I would say. Uh, they're both built on crossover platforms, but mine, I can get the hybrid. Uh, unfortunately, it's not nearly as cheap as it was when Ford launched it and made a big deal about it being a $20,000 truck, even though that was never technically true because that was predestination. Um, but, uh, yeah, now that the hybrid is the upgrade engine it's a little harder to get into one but still at this price you can get an xl for twenty seven thousand seven hundred forty dollars leaves you room to add any accessories or anything like that and i kind of look i kind of like the look of the base model on steelies i think it looks kind of good and you'll get excellent efficiency and you can still tow and haul things when you need to so i would disagree with this pick how you have Ooh. it i will keep my santa cruz uh if you stick with the turbo all-wheel drive, that will change my mind. And I know you can do that with a Maverick under 30, but... You can? Um, um, yeah. The hybrid's cool, but to me, it kind of defeats the purpose of having a little trucklet. Like, I want at least all-wheel drive because I'm going to take it not like in a hardcore off-road, but to do some mild truck duties. Okay. So moving on, um, my third pick is how I said the GLI would probably be my pick. That would be fun car, Mike, that would pick that vehicle. This would be sensible Mike, family Mike, would pick the Toyota Prius. Um, we've gone on and on about how good it is. It's, uh, it's, it is the car of the year uh, overall. Like it, It's deserving of that. It drives good. It's got good power now. It's even more efficient. It looks great. There's not much to fault. It's still um, got the hatch practicality. So I would have to get the LE, which is the entry level, front wheel drive only. Um, you still get 194 horsepower. Uh, you get these 17 inch alley wheels that are, well, they're unusual looking. They're kind of like 
<laughs> the steelies on your maverick like it looks they're alloys but they look kind of yeah they're definitely entry and mm-hmm. you still get like the eight inch screen and the the wireless um smartphone integration so you're getting the the drivability the power and the efficiency and the use of the Prius. you're just missing some of the fancier options but for that price um you know, you're, just, you're not going to make money, but you're going to sure spend a whole lot less over the life of it. Yeah, absolutely. I would just like to point out that uh, who would have thought that here in the year 2024, we'd make a list like this and the Prius would end up being one of the most powerful vehicles on the list. Yeah. Although oh. my next pick actually mm-hmm. uh, beats it by two. Um, I picked its sibling. Uh, you're talking about being practical. And I think the Corolla Cross Hybrid is an even more practical choice because it's basically a Prius crossover. Um, Similarly, you can only get into the base model for under 30,000 here. So you're looking at 29,570, but you get all wheel drive as standard Mm -hmm. in the Corolla Cross. So that bumps up the horsepower by two for 196 and you uh, still get yeah, 45, 45 miles per gallon on the highway and more space in a tailgate. So my pick is better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you do get more space and you get the um, the all-wheel drive's big, even if it's like not really all-wheel drive. It's like yes. all-wheel assist when you're stuck in <laughs> slippery conditions. True. But it doesn't, I have one in the driver right now because we'll get to that later, but um, it doesn't look like the Prius. So that's a big difference. That is a problem. So for my second last pick, I have actually been lying this whole time. This is the ultimate car that I would take for this money. Um, I think you tried to pick it too. We kind of fought over it when we were making the list. So the yes. Toyota GR86, if you get the entry level, it's 29495 after destination. There is no better performance car deal in our market than that. This is a true sporty car, sports car. You get the manual rear wheel drive. Um, you get the LSD because that's standard. You get 17 inch alloys. That's sort of the only downside because the next two trims get the 18s and the slightly um, grippier tires. But that just means you can slide it around more. Uh, you still have the 228 horsepower from the four cylinder. So mechanically, you're getting an 86 just minus the upgraded tires, which you mm-hmm. can always do yourself down the road. Maybe those 17s become, you throw some uh, winters on there. But yeah, for, for that price, you'd just be smiling every day as long as you don't have to put people in the backseat regularly. Yeah. So, I mean, you already uh, touched on it. Obviously I agree with this pick. It is, it is the purest uh, sports car choice. The, the Jetta is a cool sport compact, but it's not a dedicated rear drive sports coupe. All right. So your second last pick is my second last pick is, um, a little different out of all of these, I picked the Civic Hatchback Sport. And that is, beca- that is because the SI is no longer available under 30,000 once you add destination on. And similarly, the top trim of the hatchback is too expensive. So for this price, so you're looking at $27,455 currently you'll get the non-turbo engines of the two liters. So you're looking at around 160 horsepower, which is fine. I mean, an SI had 160 horsepower back when, uh, back in what, 2002, 2003. So it's fine. You get a, the best six speed manual out of this entire list and you get a really practical hatchback shape. So I think overall, this is a really fun daily driver that gets a good blend of fun and convenience and comfortable features. And if you don't want a six speed manual, you still are left with enough money that you can pick the CVT or the EXL for that matter. Yeah, that's a good final choice. Can't really argue with that. The Civic is such a fantastic car. Um, It's great. You were bringing up the SI because my last pick is something (laughs) similar. It's the Kia Forte GT manual. So Unusually, the absolute highest trim in the Forte lineup is this model. The manual tops even just the GT. Huh. Uh, it's the only way you can get a manual in the Forte, and it is connected to a 201 horsepower small turbo four cylinder. Stop me if you've heard this before. So <laughs> it's only 26,840 with destination, and it has 
Michelin Pilot Sport 4 summer tires on 18 alloy wheel, 18 inch alloy wheels. It has the engine and the uh, transmission I mentioned. It has tons of options because it is the fully loaded. So basically anything the Forte comes with is in this car. So it, is it as fun or precise as a Civic Si or even the Jetta GLI? I don't think so, having driven it, but you can't argue with the amount of money you save. It's almost 5,000 less than the SI. And if you don't want a manual, there's an automatic choice, which the SI doesn't give you. And uh, that even lowers the price more. So mm -hmm. that's definitely a sort of fun budget of all the vehicles here. Still yeah. gonna probably buy an 86 myself, but if I needed a sedan, this and the uh, GLI, I'd really have to drive back to back and consider. It's true. And uh, Mike, should I cover our honorable mention that we both immediately went to, but doesn't quite work? Yeah, we got to wrap this up, but obviously the most, I already talked about it today. It's true. The uh, Mazda MX-5, well, sorry, Mazda MX-5 is uh, crazy fun for the money. It is it is the most fun car on the market for per dollar easily. Uh, as much as I love the 86 and the BRZ, this is still more fun to drive, way less practical. And I'd probably buy an 86 or a BRZ over this if it was actually me because I need some more space. But the problem is this year it's now $150 over the cap. So if you can work with a um, dealer to, you know, give you 200 bucks off, then you can get under the cap. There we go. It, the answer is always Miata. Yeah. Unless you have a family. Yeah. Then now it's 86. Same thing. <laughs> All right. So uh, this has been a lengthy episode, so we'll get through yes. this quickly. But that's because we had a lot to talk about. It's true. Um, so we'll talk about what's coming up. So as I mentioned, I have a Corolla Cross Hybrid in my driveway and Kyle has a Kia Seltos. So we are comparing the two um, in a head-to-head -head battle. It's uh, it's interesting. They're very different. So we'll see how that goes. And then um, next week, you are in another electrified crossover, I believe. I am. Yes, I will be, uh, once we swap back, I will be trading in the Corolla Cross Hybrid for a RAV4 Prime. And I'm looking forward to driving it, not because anything's changed, uh, because nothing really has in the last few years, but because I haven't driven it since it launched. And the RAV4 Prime remains one of the most popular plug-in hybrids. So yeah, and, and it's the plug-in hybrid version of the best-selling crossover in the US and Canada. So I'm looking forward to spending a week with it. Hopefully, uh, maybe we'll actually get some snow to see what it's like. Who knows? Do some. You just want to go do some stoplight drag races with all that power. That thing is such a sleeper and how much it produces when it's charged up. Yes. Um, so next week, I am actually on vacation. So we will have a guest host with Kyle. So that should be fun. Uh, yes. While I am in Florida, I believe I will have an Alpha to drive. So I'll cover that more in the future. But um, next week, enjoy the show with Kyle and our special guest, and I will be back in two weeks. Yes. Thanks for listening, everyone. And this has been the Auto Guide Show, brought to you by eBay Motors. All right. See ya. eBay Motors is here for the ride. Your elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a driveway entirely its own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply.